this chapter is, is, is what's called electrochemistry. And the idea here is in electrochemistry is you're looking at the change of chemical energy into electrical energy. So in the past what we did in thermodynamics is we looked at changing chemical energy into thermal energy. Uh, here we're going to look at producing an electric current from a chemical reaction. Uh, this is really nothing more than uh, talking about battery technology. It's really what this is. Uh, and there's two ways that we're going to get <clears throat> this transfer of chemical to electrical and actually you're going to do backwards taking electrical energy and causing a chemical reaction to happen. One is uh, what's called the galvanic cell. Uh, there's actually three names for this. There's galvanic cells, voltaic cells, and electrochemical cells. Those all refer to creating an electric current from a chemical reaction. And notice the word here spontaneous. Uh, so we're going to come back to thermodynamics. We're going to go back to equilibrium in here. So that's why I like this being the second to the last unit we cover. Uh, number two, we're going to look at using the current or electric energy to make a chemical change happen. And this is very important because a lot of the discovery of the elements were discovered by using chemical, uh, I'm sorry, by using electrolysis, which is the process of using electrical energy uh, to break down compounds into their elemental state. So they call these two devices galvanic and voltaic cells, named after the two scientists that uh, did the work on it. And it's also known as an electrochemical cell in general. We call these electrical chemical cells. So essentially it's a device that's going to use to perform some sort of work. You're going to get electrical energy out of it. We're changing chemical energy into electrical energy. Uh, what's happening is electrons are moving uh, from a reducing agent to the oxidizing agent. Now remember, we're not really using reducing agent and oxidizing agent. We're going to say that the electrons move from uh, the oxidation portion, this is why we needed to talk about oxidation and reduction, to the reduction. Because remember, oxidation is where the electrons are lost and they move to the reduction portion. So down here if we have zinc and copper, this is a very typical example based on uh, volt, uh, Volta's uh, uh, battery, his electric pile. The charge here on zinc, if we put in here, the charge on zinc is zero, charge on copper is plus two, well, the charge on the zinc over here is plus 2, and the charge on the copper is 0. Well, if the zinc is 0 and it's going to plus 2, right, that's going to be oxidation. Copper is going from plus 2 and it's reducing down. It's going down from positive charge to 0. That's going to be our reduction. So what's happening here is that the electrons are moving from the zinc to the copper. That's the direction the electrons are moving from, from the oxidation to the reduction process. And this is why this process happens because electrons are being transferred from zinc metal to the copper. Now what we would do is you could you could take zinc metal and put it into a copper solution and this process would happen but you wouldn't have a battery. In order to get a battery what you have to do is you have to separate out the two sides. Right? This is a gen general form of what we would have. You would have the solutions here with the electrodes in here and electrons removed. Now the problem with setting up this way is that electrons would move over here and you're going to get a buildup of electric charge, negative charge on this side. You get more and more negative charge, more and more positive charge, and this is not a good scenario because these could come together. Now that's not going to happen because as soon as the electrons move over here, the battery stops and it's dead and nothing happens. We need something else in here is the point. We need something to continuously complete the circuit. Remember, there's no completing of the circuits. We need to add something to do that. What we do is we add a salt bridge. It's really important because the salt bridge allows the flow and migration of electrons to keep going through our battery, and this allows us to, uh, um, you know, make a battery work. So you have to have a salt bridge, and a lot of students forget that part because you might have to sketch a general diagram, and it might ask you for some missing pieces, but that's generally the idea there. All right. So the parts of a galvanic cell is that we have a, an electrode, and there's two electrodes. One's going to be called the cathode, and another one is called the anode. All right. And there's two portions. So that that's what we would have if we go back to my picture here. We would have an anode and a cathode, two different sides of the battery. All right, so the electrons are always going to travel, always. This, this is always true, always from the anode to the cathode. Why? Because oxidation always occurs at the anode. Okay, oxidation is always going to occur here. So therefore, it's always going to lose electrons. And if electrons are lost, they're always going to move towards the cathode. So therefore, this one is always going to be true. Um, again, I'm using terms oxidizing agent and reducing agent, but you can think of the cathode as pulling electrons if you want to change this to cathode. Um, I, I don't know why they're removing that term. It's a really good term to know, but 
um, but we're, we're not going to focus on it for right now. So the cathode you can think of as pulling, or you can think of the anode as pushing electrons through the wire. So this is a better representation of our, our cell. So we have here the zinc metal placed into a zinc solution, copper metal placed into a copper solution. So no reaction can happen between these two because they're separated from each other. There's, there's no connection. Now, if we hook up wires to this and we put a voltmeter in here, we can measure the voltage going across the wire. Hopefully you know some stuff about electrical energy from physics, but the cathode is going to, I'm sorry, the anode is going to lose electrons, right? Electrons are always going to go in this direction from your anode to your cathode. Oop, I probably should change that because this is backwards. This one is, this should be the cathode. And this should be the anode. Because we said earlier, remember if we, we talked earlier, this is your, um, zinc is going to lose electrons and the copper is going to gain electrons. If you don't remember, stop the video and go back to the beginning where I talked about the, the zinc and the copper. All right. So we got electrons moving in this direction, going from zinc to the copper. So how do I know that? Because I know uh, that the zinc solid is going to lose electrons and what's going to happen is zinc ions are going to go into solution. I'll show you that in just a second. All right. So the idea here is that for a spontaneously, uh, you know, for battery to work, especially for it to be spontaneous, the zinc is going to lose electrons to the copper ions. So the potential energy is higher for the electrons on the anode side than it is for the cathode. You could think of the anode as like a top of a waterfall. Water always runs downhill because there's higher potential energy at the top of the hill than there is at the bottom of the hill. Uh, the anode is the same idea. It has a higher potential for the electron than it does the cathode. So therefore the electron is going to be pushed or pulled through the wire and that's our driving force. The driving force is the difference in potential energies between those two electrodes. And we measure that difference in what are called volts. Now this potential difference has a name and we call it the electromotive force or EMF. And the EMF is, as I said, is measured in voltage and it's the joules, the energy per coulombic charge. And we'll talk a lot more about coulombic charge later. Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about this definition of voltage. Hopefully you know some stuff about uh, volts from physics, but if not, we'll talk more about it. So for a spontaneous process or a thermodynamically favorable process, the cell potential is always positive. Always positive. We now have a third way to know if, it, if, if, if a process is spontaneous. Free energy has to be negative, K has to be greater than 1, and now our cell potential has to be positive. So three ways to tell if something is thermodynamically favorable. All right, let's take a look at the last little bit. So for our cell potential, the magnitude of that cell potential, the magnitude of the voltage coming off, is obviously dependent on the reaction. If I change the reaction, I'm going to change the, the voltage. Put different metals in, I get different voltage. Uh, concentration is going to have an effect. So if I change the concentration of my solutions, we'll talk about that later, that has an effect as well. And the temperature also has an effect. So therefore, since concentration and temperature, all these things have an effect, we're going to have to use standard conditions again. So we're going to talk pressure is 1 atm, concentrations are 1. So therefore, all concentrations would be unified. Our temperature is often 298, but as we saw in thermodynamics, temperature can vary and it will change. So we're going to take our cell potential and make it standard conditions for the cell potential. So you're going to see this little degree symbol quite often uh, when we draw, write these out. So our cell voltage for the zinc-copper one is going to be 1.1 volts.